to Sunday Catch Up. Thank you for joining us. It is great to be able to continue to connect with you online. We are presently in a series looking at Psalms. Ruth will be looking at Psalm 46 later and helping us to unpack what it means to relate to God in times and places when life is challenging. Certainly a message for our time. But we begin by having our weekly news. Welcome to our weekly news. Climate change and the impact on our environment are things which are regularly in our news at this present time. We face huge challenges. As Christians, we want to respond to God's call to care for our creation. Would you be willing to be part of a small team at Holy Trinity Nailsey looking at what it means to be eco-church here in this place? to look at the impact for our buildings and the way we do our community life together and look at our individual lifestyles. We have had some people say they'll be willing to be involved. Thank you to those who've responded already. But we're still looking for others, and if that could be you, please email welcome at holytrinitynailsy.org.uk and we'll get back to you in September, if not before, where we, when we'll be looking at taking this forward. The rest of our news is on the weekly news sheet, which should be emailed to you. If you don't get it, please get in touch with the office. Thank you for reading it. Loving Lord God, you tell us in Psalm 119 that, uh, that your word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. And, and we need that. We know we need that. We need that light to help us stay on the path and to guide us home to you. And so we turn to your word now and we pray for that light, that we would see you more clearly and that we would see how to live with you more clearly. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to Stuart and then Ruth. Thank you. Good morning. Today's reading from God's Word is Psalm 146, Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Sorry? Sorry? I think there may have been a miscommunication. It's Psalm 46. Whoops. Mind you, that was a lovely one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how, how are you ad living? Oh, I'll do my best. But um, I could tell you a story about that, but okay. I won't. <laughs> I won't. Um, if you want to know it... Talk to Tim Moulding about it because I shared it with him earlier. Right. Is that right? Psalm 46. Either I, well, yeah, probably I misread. Anyway, let's see how we get on. <laughs> Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow 
and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, brilliant, Stuart. It just proves we don't need to practice. We don't need our large print version. <laughs> we just need the Lord to be our, our fortress and to stand beside us and help us through. Let's pray together. Lord, may my words be your words. And may our hearts be open so that each one of us here today hears the thing that you particularly want to say to them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as James said, I'm Ruth Jolly. I'm more often to be found at one of our other two congregations, but I love coming to 1045, and it's really nice. I was going to say to see your faces again, but perhaps I should say to see half your faces again. Over these summer weeks, we're looking at Psalms for today. They're poems or songs from the Bible's book of Psalms, which particularly speak to our current circumstances. We've looked at what it means for God to bless us. We've looked at ways and places that we can praise and worship God. And today, in Psalm 46, we look at relating to God in times and places where we definitely aren't feeling particularly blessed, and when praise and worship do not spring automatically to our lips. I wonder what times there have been in your life when you've desperately felt in need of a refuge. Maybe you've been out in a blazing storm with the rain or hail teeming down and the wind howling, and you've just wanted to find shelter, any kind of shelter. Maybe you've walked alone after dark, and heard footsteps echoing behind you and felt really uncomfortable. Maybe you've been in a situation where you were being physically or emotionally attacked or abused and you so much wanted somewhere to hide. Maybe you've just felt overwhelmed by everything that's going on in your life. And I think over the past year or 18 months, Many of us have felt like that. Well, the psalm we've just read paints a number of pictures of just those kind of circumstances, but with running through them like a golden thread, the fact of God, the almighty God, who holds everything in his hands, who is the refuge into which we, his dismayed and disorientated children, can just run and hide. When I was a child, I used to suffer from nightmares. Now, I have to admit, some of them weren't quite genuine, because um, if I went downstairs in my pajamas and I said, I dreamt that lions were eating me up, there was always the hope that I'd get a taste of that delicious supper that the rest of the family were having after I'd been tucked up. But it could also happen that I would have a really terrifying dream and I would wake up shaking and hardly able to move and I would scream for my mother and she would come and put her arms around me and just hold me safe. She was my refuge when I, when I was terrified. That's the picture of God in today's psalm, a safe stronghold into which we can run to be safe. Psalms are poems, and the shape of them is really important. The one that we heard read just now falls into three sections, and if you had the original Hebrew open in front of you, probably like me, you wouldn't understand a word, but I'm told reliably that each section ends with the little word selah, and nobody knows what it means. We think it may be a musical instruction because the psalm was written to be sung. But it is really helpful because it shows us for sure how this psalm divides up and it helps us to understand what the psalmist is doing with it. 
So the first section is verses 1 to 3 of the psalm, and it gives us the whole theme as a kind of overview. You probably noticed when Stuart was reading it that two of the sections had a kind of a refrain or a chorus after them. Um, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That little chorus isn't missing from the first section. It's actually just that it's at the beginning, not at the end, and it's the other way round. So it says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And those words sum up the whole of what the psalmist wants to say to us today. Whatever happens in life, however far away God may seem, however out of control our circumstances may be, God is there, a safe hiding place like my mother's arms, not always sweeping the trouble away, far more often standing alongside us in it, strengthening us, giving us someone to lean on. The psalmist visualizes the trouble in terms of natural disaster, the earth giving way, the mountains falling and quaking, the sea foaming and roaring. And we know what he means, because although most of us probably have never actually experienced an earthquake, we have seen what it does to a place on our television screens, haven't we? We've seen the the collapse of buildings, the total chaos, the dust and the dirt and the rubble all around, and the sea roaring and foaming. We remember that huge tsunami back in 2004, the total devastation when the water rolled back in, the horrific death toll. We know just what he's talking about. But disasters aren't only natural disasters. These verses may also bring to mind emotional upheavals that we have all experienced, maybe the severe illness or the death of somebody you dearly love, maybe a sense of betrayal by someone you were used to trusting, maybe illness or disability which can either strike you suddenly or creep up gradually, maybe even just the challenge of beginning to pick up the threads of normal everyday life, coming back into church, taking a bus or a train, something that probably most of us haven't done for a long time. It can feel quite overwhelming. We can feel silly because something seems hard. It doesn't stop it feeling hard. You know, um, a week or so back, I had to organize uh, a party just a small one, but it was a celebration of one of those birthdays with a zero on the end that we all experience every 10 years. And I don't do hospitality easily. I find it really hard to organize something like that. And I got in quite a stew about it. It was only family coming, but anyway. And I was reading my Bible reading uh, one day. I've been working my way through Isaiah, just reading a few verses each day. And God said this, Psalm, uh, Isaiah, ver, chap, ver, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you. Wasn't that a beautiful thing for God to say to me when it was just really ordinary, everyday circumstances that I wasn't coping with, never mind all the other things that have been going on? So those times when the next hour or the next day or the next week seems totally impossible, totally unmanageable, and you just want to cry out, I cannot do this. At those times, God is our refuge. We need the healing salve of the next section, verses 4 to 7. In the midst of the tsunami and the earthquake, when life all around is crumbling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. The tumult and the rumbling and the disintegration are real. But the holy place and the river that runs through it, bringing gladness, the outpouring of quietness and safety is also real, even when our emotions shout so loudly that we can't hear the still, quiet voice of God. He is still there. He is still our refuge, and he never 
ever leaves us alone. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. But what does it look like to run into the arms of God and be safe? Because we can't see a physical being with arms stretched wide. We can't see an actual fortified castle that we can run into and lower the portcullis and be safe. How can we experience God being there with us? I think there are two primary ways in which we experience God. Part of it is with our mind. We know things about God. We've read about him in the Bible. We've talked about him to one another. We've heard sermons. We've read commentaries. We know a lot of things about God. And one of the things we know is that he's always there. Part of it's through our emotions. We feel our love for him. And sometimes we can feel his love for us. Neither of those ways is going to function perfectly. All of us know times when we say, how on earth could I ever have believed that stuff? None of it seems to make sense anymore. All of us know times when we feel as though there's just a wall and we can't know God's presence at all with our feelings. Sometimes we just have to hang on in there and wait for the world to turn right side up again and to be able to sense his presence again. When it does, we realize he's been there all along. So returning to Psalm 46, verses 8 to 11, beautifully sum up that confusion in our thinking and experience, right alongside the unchanging reliability and unconquerable power of God. They start with an invitation, come and see what the Lord has done. And indeed, we must come and see what he's done, and we must share with one another what he's done for us, and we must remember all the times he's been there. Let's start right here by acknowledging, though, the desolation. It says the desolation he has brought on all the earth. Not that God actually does bring desolation, but that he is the one who is completely in control of everything. And so even the desolation is under his caring hands. We say in those difficult times, if God loved me, he wouldn't do this to me. But no, that's not right. Because God loves me, I'm not alone in this nightmare. He will never leave me or forsake me. He will walk through the muck and the rubble with me, and I will know his love. Ultimately, God will bring to an end all suffering and conflict. He will make all weapons, whether actual or emotional, just into more rubbish. He'll bring stillness in the midst of the turmoil. The whole world will be silenced and will have to acknowledge that he is God and he will be exalted and above all the fighting and squabbling and self-seeking of the nations and his full control of all the situations will be visible. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. But I wonder what sort of rubble there is in your life, because all of us carry with us the debris of past suffering and difficult times that we've experienced, and maybe the shattered hopes of present disaster too. We look round and we see the bricks and the stones and the dust and the rubbish of things that were once so important to us, and we wonder how we can ever rebuild our lives. And at that moment when disaster strikes and when we most need God, that's the moment when so often we seem unable to find him. Even Jesus, hanging in agony on the cross, cried out in desolation, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can look at Jesus in that situation and we know the end of the story. We know that God had his plans all set to raise him from the dead in triumphant victory over death. And can I just point out, Jesus knew that too. He had been telling his disciples for days and weeks and months, 
that he was going to be killed and on the third day rise again. He knew the end of the story, but still, in that moment of agony, he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he was in the thick of it, what he knew was very different from what he felt. Sometimes, we try too hard to be good Christians. We try to have the kind of faith that moves mountains. We try to work ourselves up to it. We hope that if we get it all right, somehow our prayers will be answered and we can make God bring it all right because one, two, three adds up. It doesn't work like that. The good news of Jesus, what we see with Jesus in desolation on the cross is that our feelings don't have to be in the right place for God to be working. We don't have to manufacture enough faith to get us through the swamp. We don't have to pretend to feel triumphant when all we want to shout is, I can't do this. It's not be still and feel wonderful, however tough life gets. It's be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted above the earth. It's not God will miraculously pull you out of every difficult situation. Sometimes he does, and it's wonderful when he does, but my goodness, sometimes he doesn't. It's the Lord Almighty is with us in the difficult situation, in the rubble and the chaos and the muck. There is God right alongside us. There is Jesus dying on the cross to set us free. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray together. Lord, when life is in turmoil and our inner cry is, I can't do this, may we remember that you are our refuge and that you never ever leave us. Help us through the shouting and the chaos to hear your voice telling us, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and going through agony yourself to set us free. of the